Shalom, this is Pastor Roy Blight. I'm the pastor here at Messiah House in Lake Worth, Florida. We're a Messianic community. And this is Torah Tuesday, and we're going into the Torah portion for this week. And it's a wonderful Torah portion, Pikude. And it's talking about sanctification, justification, and being washed by the Lord. And it's it's got a lot to do. This Torah portion, which is obviously in Exodus, is very spiritual. And you have to understand that the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we're going to get right into this. Remember, we start out with the uh, New Covenant Torah part of the Torah portion, and we work our way to the original meat of the Torah portion, and it's always a wonderful teaching, so stay tuned. Now, as we, as we look at our Torah portion today, the real subject matter that we're getting into is we call a washed sanctified and justified because this is exactly what god's word does for us and we want to understand what the holy spirit is doing in our lives and the holy spirit is all over the studies that we do in torah a lot of people just don't realize that it's there we're going to start with the new covenant portion though and we're going to start with what it says in first corinthians 3 and in hebrews chapter 13 we're going to be touching on a lot of scriptures but that's going to be the basis of our our beginning here in the new covenant now it says in Hebrews 13, 10, we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. Now, what would the new covenant Jewish believer have to understand about that if he didn't have any understanding of what it says in the Torah about the tabernacle and the construction of the tabernacle and all that we see therein? Because it is all tied together. The things that uh, Moses had and Moses wrote about in the Old Covenant, in the Torah, they're types, shadows, and patterns of something that is in the new, and that's what we're touching on today. So what we're really discussing here is the spiritual temple. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, for example. And the, the tabernacle of Moses is a replica of the, of the tabernacle, the throne room of God that we see in heaven. So we're looking at, this is a study of the spiritual temple and our relationship to that temple through Yeshua, Jesus, our high priest. This is what is all it is talking about. And we see that the symbolism that is contained therein is powerfully woven through this Torah portion today. In Hebrews 13, it says, We have an altar from which the priests in the tabernacle have no right to eat. Under the old system, the high priest brought the blood of animals into the holy place as a sacrifice for sin. And the bodies of the animals were burned outside the camp. You see, the altar in the tabernacle and later in the temple was sanctified with the blood of bulls and goats. We have a spiritual altar through Yeshua, Jesus, that has been sanctified by his own precious blood that he shed on the cross for us. You see, Yehovah ordained different types of sacrifices for different purposes. Some were burned. For others, the instructions were that a select portion be burned and another set aside as meat to be eaten in Jehovah's presence. The priests in the tabernacle did not receive land as an inheritance. They received this portion of meat from the sacrifices. This was their inheritance, their rightful share. It was their birthright. A key phrase here is, we have an altar from which those, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. That's very confusing if you just look at it in, it, in its own place there. The fra this phrase indicates that the altar of Messiah is not available to those who attempt to find merit through the Levitical system, through physical birthright, or through good works, or the ritualistic expression of the Sinai Covenant given in the law of Moses. It's something else. This is what the writer to the Hebrews is getting at. Such people do not serve Jehovah. <clears throat> they think they do, but they're not. You see, Jehovah gave his son and offered the sacrifice to end all sacrifices, but they serve their religion with its traditions. And we see this is what the writer to Hebrews, <clears throat> this is the distinction that he's making. But they knew the law. They, the right to eat of the sacrifices belongs to those who do the work of God. That was the Levites. That was the purpose of the Levitical priesthood, that they had no physical inheritance of land, but the sacrifices were their seat. They were the ones that were serving the Lord. 
It says in John 6, the words of the Lord. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. If you don't believe in the Son of God whom the Father has sent, you've got no place with God at all. You've got no right to eat at his table. You will not get to his table. You are on the outside looking in. You see, a Jew, Yeshua had just fed the 5,000. And this this questioning that they that they wanted to know, he would he continue to give them food so they wouldn't have to worry about having enough anymore? Maybe they could work for him. And they were trying to figure all of these things out. The work that he told them wasn't wasn't physical but spiritual. The sad thing was they weren't ready to sign up for that. They couldn't do it because they didn't have any understanding. Continuing to speak in a spiritual sense, Jesus Yeshua said. My, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. And understand, this is a spiritual statement for spiritual people to discern spiritually. It's not understood at all by physically and, and carnally minded people. So our messianic application in all of this is, is very clear today. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is the point that Jesus made in the in his uh, gospels. This is the this is a big theme in the writers, the letters that we see in the New Covenant, that we as believers in Jesus, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the tabernacle that contains the Spirit of God within us. Now, where is the spiritual temple with its spiritual with, with its special off altar? Well, you're the temple of God. That's the point. And within you resides everything that we're talking about. So this Torah portion, Pekude, talking about the temple, the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness, and of course later the temple, the symbolism contained therein has to do with you as a believer in the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Son of God, the coming King of Kings. We see this written by Paul in 1 Corinthians 3. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles, in verse 17, it says, If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. It couldn't be more clear than that. And you see, it may start to line up with the things we saw in the Gospels too. J Jesus said, But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. And these things defile a person. He's talking about your body, your life, you, who you are. And out of the out of the heart, and it, it's the different for everyone. For out of the heart come evil ideas, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These things come out of the heart of man. The, our hearts are are despicable. Our hearts are are wicked. They're in darkness. But we have to understand that God wants to cleanse, help us cleanse this temple. He wants us to cleanse this tabernacle that he's given to us where the Holy Spirit resides. And this is the job of everybody that's a believer in the Messiah. And we see this. Paul wrote to Titus, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This is the central theme of our Torah portion today, being cleansed, being sanctified, being washed by the Lord, and being justified in His sight, not because of anything we've done, but understanding that He wants us to have a clean temple. Before you came to Yeshua, Jesus, were you holy? Do you remember how defiled you were? I do. What kind of sacrifice did it take to wash you clean, as clean as you were when you were first born? What gives the Holy Spirit the go-ahead to make it seem like you've been born again and made a new creature? Where, where does it stop and where does it start? Jesus said, Abba, Father, not what I will, but as you will. It comes down to, are you willing to do what God wants you to do in all cases? And this is the central idea in the new covenant about this, about what we're seeing, that we are the temple of God. It says in Hebrews 10, 
Then said he, Lo, I am come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which we will, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. His sacrifice met all the righteous requirements of the law. Sins have been forgiven, and atonement had, has been forgiven. Is the spiritual blessing limited to a physical nation? Hardly. You see, he made the sacrifice for us. Paul wrote, but on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God. His sacrifice has allowed grace to come into our lives, and this is a big, we are saved by grace through faith. Paul went on, he said, I am a special messenger from Christ Jesus to you Gentiles. I bring you the good news so that I might present you as an acceptable offering to God, made holy by the Holy Spirit. So this is what the Lord is working in all of us, that we become holy in the Holy Spirit, and that our temples become clean. This is God's idea. This is what God wants in our lives. In the book of Acts, in Acts 13, in, this is in the synagogue in uh, Antioch. Paul told them, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law. Again, it comes back to understanding who we are in our own selves. We're nothing. We're lost without the blood of Jesus cleansing us. The first cleansing we go through is what Jesus does, and he has already paid the price. He said, but the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, your spirit, and these things defile a person. We come to the Lord in a defiled state, but he is the one who cleanses us because we believe and we trust in him. It sounds so simple, but it's so profoundly real and so profoundly true that your faith in Jesus is what will set you apart and allow him to begin the work in all of us. And, and again, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and such were some of you, but you were cleansed or washed. You were made holy sanctified. You were made right with God, justified. That's why we come to you today telling you this whole Torah portion is about being washed, being sanctified, and being justified before the Lord, because it's all according to the same pattern. And we see this pattern that has been brought to us because Jesus is resurrected from the dead. Jesus has was crucified for our sins. He's resurrected for the from the dead in order that he can fulfill all the promises that are written in the old covenant and the new covenant, but in the law and the prophets and in the gospels, because Jesus is alive right now at the right hand of the father. He's alive right now, making intercession for the saints. And he, this tabernacle that we see in, in the wilderness with Moses is a replica of exactly what is going on in heaven for us right now. That's why the writer to the Hebrews says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. This is what it's talking about. You aren't going to go to the temple in Jerusalem. has been destroyed. It was destroyed in 70 AD. It, it can do nothing for you. We're talking about a different temple temple, a different tabernacle, and you are that temple where the Holy Spirit resides in you if you trust in Jesus. This is the point the writer to the Hebrews is making. He said, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, the house of God is, is you as part of the body of Christ. He said, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So he's speaking to us. We are the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we see that the, we, all of this, the symbolism that is involved in this is extraordinary. And this is what we want to look at. So understanding this symbolism and understanding this extraordinary picture that God has painted for us, that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, now let us go into our Torah portion and see the details and the great and the great uh, amount of thing of energy and of writing that God put into the Torah to get us to see 
this tabernacle, to get us to see this temple, to get us to give us an idea of what we are supposed to become. And that is why Parashat 23 is Pekude, which means countings. And it sounds, you know, if you just study it physically and with the power of your own brain, you're not going to get much out of it. But when you understand the spiritual ramifications behind it, it is astounding, and it'll help you to understand who you are in Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah. And this is from Exodus chapter 35, 1 to 40, 38. We are actually ending the, uh, the book of Exodus here today, and in our yearly going around the year in the Torah portions. So we're ending Exodus, and we're moving on. So this is Parashah Pekude. The last parasha from the book of Exodus is called Pekude, which means accounts. The first words of the first verse of the reading could be translated to read, these are the accounts, Pekude, of the tabernacle. This last reading from Exodus begins with an audit of how the contributions for the tabernacle were to be used. So God is concerned with every part of the tabernacle, just like he's concerned with every part of our loves. Our, our lives, and he wants us to understand that he is involved in every part of our lives. He knows everything. He sees everything. He's concerned about you from head to toe. Every part of your life he is concerned with. You are the temple of God, remember. To begin the parasha, Moses made an accounting, pukude, uh, of the materials that were donated from the construction of the Mishkan, or the tabernacle. Then Bezalel and Olhilab made the priestly garments, the ephod or apron, the breastplate, the cloak, the crown, the hat, the tunic, the sash, and breeches, all according to the specifications given to Moses on the mount, and also given in Parashat Tetzave, which if this sounds like it's repeating, some of it is repeating, but that's how thorough the Word of God is about these things, and how important it really is. When you look at the tabernacle, there are over there's like 40 chapters concerning with the construction of the tabernacle. Either it's 40 of the most boring chapters you could possibly study, or there's something that's alive and is spiritual and is important to understand about the, the, the tabernacle that is written in the Torah. So the parasha begins. These are the records of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of the testimony, as they were recorded at the commandment of Moses. The responsibility of the Levites under the direction of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the high priest. All the components of the Mishkan are brought to Moses, who then erects it and anoints it with the holy anointing oil. Aaron and his four sons are initiated into the priesthood. And the parasha concludes with a cloud of glory appearing over the Mishkan, the tabernacle, signifying that Jehovah's presence has come to dwell within it. So this is a, there's a lot going here, a lot going on here spiritually, and a lot here that's that's taking place that God wants us to understand and He wants us to see. So you have all these plans for the tabernacle that are out there. It was por portable. It was permanent. The presence of God is in it. The construction of the Mishkan continued with Bezalel and Oliabab leading the work. Remember, they were the anointed ones. Note again that Bezalel or Bezalel is a type of Messiah, a man called by name from the tribe of Judah, who is filled with the Spirit of God, and whose name means in the shadow of God. There's not a name in the Bible that, that doesn't have a meaning that, that takes place in the Scripture that it's important. Every name, every number, these are all important within the Scriptures. And as you study them, you'll, you'll allow the Holy Spirit to show you things that you never would have seen before without the Holy Spirit showing you. Now, Bezalel's chief assistant is Aholiab, a man from the tribe of Dan, whose name means the Father's Tent. And we see that all the things that were given, the materials and what it represented, the shatim wood, the gold, the silver, and the brass, the colors that are there, all of it matters. It shows four profiles of Christ and reflects the four Gospels, actually. Purple, white linen, scarlet, and blue, representing the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's all there, and they're all amazing studies that, that, that will astound you. Now, the, in, the, in the tabernacle itself, in the outer court, everything was made of bronze. In the tent, everything was made of gold and silver. The people brought special offerings of gold, totaling 2,193 pounds, as measured by the weight of the sanctuary shekel. 
The gold was used throughout the tabernacle, inside the tent, for all the pieces of furniture there. It says, the whole community of Israel gave 7,545 pounds of silver as measured by the weight of the sanctuary shekel. This silver came from the tax collected from each man registered in the census. The tax is one beka, which is half a shekel, based on the sanctuary shekel. The tax was collected from six, 603,550 men who had reached their 20th birthday. Notice this, the, how specific all of this really is. The hundred bases for the frames of the sanctuary walls and for the posts supporting the inner curtain required 7,500 pounds of silver, about 75 pounds for each base. The remaining 45 pounds of silver was used to make the hooks and rings and to overlay the tops of the post. So it was all used in the construction of the tabernacle inside and out. The people also brought a special, as special offerings 5,310 pounds of bronze, which was used for casting the bases for the posts at the entrance of the tabernacle and for the bronze altar with its bronze grating and all the altar utensils. Bronze was also used to make the bases for the posts that supported the curtains around the courtyard. The bases for the curtain at the entrance of the courtyard and all the tent pegs for the tabernacle and the courtyard. Then the, in the Torah portion, we get into the priestly garments. It says in Exodus 39, of the blue, purple, and scarlet thread, they made garments of ministry for ministering in the holy place and made the holy garments of Aaron as Jehovah had commanded Moses. All the instructions that Moses received on the mountain, all these were put into place. They had to do with every aspect of the tabernacle, the priest's clothing, uh, the things that they wore in the tabernacle, everything was given to them very precisely. The ephod, it was spoken about in verse 2, it says, He made the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and of fine woven linen. And they beat the gold into thin sheets and cut it into threads to work it in with the blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and the fine linen into artistic designs. These two men, Bezalel and Oholiab, were very busy. They were very anointed of the Holy Spirit, and everything was very ornate. ornate going into the, the priestly robes, going into every aspect of the furniture, and every part of the tabernacle was done in great detail. It says in verse 4, they made shoulder straps for it, for to couple it together. It was coupled together as its two edges, and the intricately woven band of his ephod that was on it was of the same workmanship. Woven of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and of fine woven linen, as Jehovah had commanded Moses. So all these things came from the Lord through Moses, and they're putting them in place. And they set onyx stones, enclosed in settings of gold. They were engraved as signets are engraved, with the names of the sons of Israel. He put them on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel, as Jehovah had commanded Moses. So you see the pattern there. Then the breastplate is, was discussed. And he made the breastplate art of, artistically woven like the workmanship of the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and the fine woven linen. They made the breastplate square by doubling it. A span was its length, and a span its width then uh, when doubled. So we see then the gemstones of, of the uh was set on the breastplate, and they set it in four rows of stones. They were enclosed in settings of gold in their in their mountings. There were twelve stones according to the names of the sons of Israel, according to their names engraved like a signet, each one with its own name according to the twelve tribes. So these twelve stones over the heart of the high priest represented the twelve tribes of Israel. Showing you, of course, that these that these were God's people and they meant a lot to the Lord. And the high priest was representing the 12 tribes and, and they were to be the ones to minister for the Lord. And of course, in row one, you had Reuben, which was uh, Sardius, Simeon, Topaz, Levi, Emerald. Row two, you had Judah, which was Turquoise, and Issachar, Sapphire, and Zebulun, which is Diamond. Row three, you had Dan, which is Jason, Naphtali, which is Agate and Gad, which is Amethyst. And then row four, you had Asher, which is Beryl, 
Joseph, Onyx, and Benjamin, which was Jasper. Very ornate, very particular. Nothing was there done by accident. It was all spelled out by the Lord to Moses. And the priestly garments going on, and they made chains for the breastplate at the ends, like braided cords of pure gold. They also made two settings of gold and two gold rings, and put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. Amazing detail. And they put the two braided chains of gold in the two rings on the ends of the breastplate. The two ends of the two braided chains they fastened in the two settings and put them on the shoulder straps of the ephod in the front. And they bound the breastplate by means of its rings to the rings of the ephod with a blue cord so that it would be above the intricately woven band of the ephod and that the breastplate would not come loose from the ephod as Jehovah had commanded Moses. Then it talks about the robe. He made the robe of the ephod of woven work all of blue, and there was an opening in the middle of the robe, like the opening in a coat of mail, with a woven binding all around the opening so that it would not tear. They made on the hem of the robe pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet, and of fine woven linen. And they made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates on the hem of the robe all around between the pomegranates. A bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, all around the hem of the robe to minister in, as Jehovah had commended them. Remember, all of this is written down. It seems, well, this is really boring. It's going on and on and on. But listen, this is the details that God gave to Moses that they put in place perfectly in order to please the Lord. And look at all around you in nature. Look at all around you in your world. Look at the intricate design that you see in all the trees of nature. And you see in the animals. Everything is perfection before the Lord. And these, these implements that are in the tabernacle and the clothing of the priest shows you the intricacy and the brilliance and the mind of the Lord. And you have to understand that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He's far more detailed than any of us are, and we need to understand that nothing here is there by accident. They made, It says they made tunics artificially woven of fine linen for Aaron and his sons, a turban of fine linen, exquisite hats of fine linen, short trousers of fine woven linen, and a sash of fine woven linen with blue, purple, and scarlet thread made by a weaver as Jehovah had commanded Moses. Nothing was, no detail was left incomplete. Then they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold and wrote on it an inscription like the engraving of a signet. It said, Holiness to Jehovah. And they tied to it a blue cord to fasten it above the turban as Jehovah had commanded Moses. And so thus all of the, all of the, uh, things of the tabernacle and of the, of the meeting was finished. So they completed everything, and it was done. And they put it into place, and, and there they were. And it says, And the children of Israel did according to all that Jehovah had commanded. Moses, so they did. And they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent and all its furnishings. Then Moses uh, came over, over all the uh, work, and indeed, they had done it as Jehovah had commanded, just so they had done it. And Moses blessed them. So Moses was the one that received all the instructions, brought it to the children of Israel through Bazalel and Oholiab and the others that were working there. And all the contributions which people gladly gave to them, all of it was finished. The entire work of the tabernacle was done before the Lord, and they, and they were blessed. So when we study the, the tabernacle and we look at the symbolism involved and we look at the intricate detail involved, we're looking at something that is higher than mankind. We're looking in, into something that is bigger and more complete and more wonderful than mankind. And yet you, as a believer in Jesus, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, remember, the temple was much, much grander and ornate than the tent that Moses had in the wilderness. What Solomon had put together was amazing and was and was costly. But you're the temple of God. You're more costly than that original temple that Solomon put together. And everything in the tabernacle reflects exactly who you are as a believer in Jesus Christ. It says, and then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, on the first day of the month, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. You shall put in 
put in it the ark of the testimony and partition off the ark with the veil. Now this, remember that the, inside the tent, this is where the presence of God was. And now Moses is giving the instructions that God gave of how to separate the holy place from the holy of holies. And he shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it. And he shall hollow it and all its utensils and it shall be holy. It's to be set apart for, for the use of God. And the priests that were there, they were they had to be really on their best behavior at all times. You shall anoint <clears throat> all of the burnt offerings and all its utensils and consecrate the altar. The altar shall be most holy. And he shall anoint the laver and its base and consecrate it. The altar was most holy. It was a type of a greater altar. Now we glory in this greater altar. And of course, this greater altar is perfectly represented by Jesus and the cross that Jesus died on. This was the altar where the ultimate sacrifice was given. And we see this symbolism in the tabernacle. Paul wrote to the Galatians about who we are exactly before the Lord. Paul wrote, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. You see, Paul is talking exactly about this, this setting apart that we have in Jesus. The cross of Jesus separates. The cross of Jesus is most holy, and it's perfectly represented in the altar that was in the courtyard there. So we see all of this is put in place. All of it matters. All of it has some has symbolic meaning for us. And here we, and here we are when we study it, we should be in awe, understanding that the, the, the presence of God was in the, this tabernacle, just like the presence of God is in you, his tabernacle today, you who are a follower of Jesus the Messiah. If you're not a follower of Jesus Messiah, none of this makes sense to you. He's not in you, and you can't even confess that he's Lord unless the Spirit of God is in you. It goes on in the Torah in Exodus. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and wash them with water. He shall put the holy garments on Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him that he may minister to me as priest. And you shall bring his sons and clothe them with tunics. You shall anoint them as you anointed their father that they may minister to me as priests. For their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Thus Moses did according to all that Jehovah had commanded him. So he did. So Moses finished the work. And so did you catch all of this? Everything that we looked at just now in the Torah portion in Pekude talked about the construction of the tabernacle and all the details that are in. It is all symbolic of something that Jesus Christ gave to us. This, this tabernacle that is in the heavens, where Jesus is on the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. And you are the temple of God. You are the tabernacle of God. You have the presence of God in you, just as the tabernacle had the presence of God in the days of Moses in the Holy of Holies. In your spirit, there resides the very presence of God himself. And it tells us, and thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and wash them with water. Wash them with water. The watering of the word of God. This is what this is being discussed. Only the word of God can cleanse you. Only the blood of Jesus can take away your sins. And these are all perfectly represented in the tabernacle and all the sacrifices and all the things that we're discussing here according to the tabernacle. And it says, and thou, thou shalt anoint them as thou didst appoint, appoint their father, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. For their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. God was very serious about what he was putting in place. And you, as a follower of Jesus, you are now, you're the royal priesthood. You're the holy nation. You, as a follower of Jesus, you are his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are a king and a priest in Jesus. And the work that is being discussed in the tabernacle is the same work spiritually we do in his kingdom today. And he put in the altar 
of the burnt offering by the door of the tabernacle of the tent of, of the congregation and offered upon it the burnt offering and the meat offering as the Lord commanded Moses. You see, we are in Jesus. We're washed by the blood of the lamb and we're washed by the washing of the water of the word. We're sanctified. We're made holy. We're set apart for his usage. We are priests in his kingdom. We are the ministers of the gospel. We are the ministers in the tabernacle, his tabernacle. And understand, we are justified by his sacrifice for us. All the symbolism that we know today in Christianity, most Christians have no idea of all that the symbolism gives to us, but it's all there. And as we study the symbolism of the tabernacle, it all represents the perfect work of our high priest who made intercession for us today. And he, he died for us and he's making intercession for the saints even right now in the tabernacle that is in heaven. What a wonderful, beautiful uh, message this is that we see hidden in the Torah portion today. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and and then Yah, then the the place of Yahweh was filled. The presence of God of Yahweh filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it, and the glory of Jehovah filled the tabernacle. The literal presence of God on planet Earth was in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, and Moses was there, and the Spirit of the Lord filled the place. Whenever the cloud was taken up above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. They knew when to leave. They knew when to go. They knew the direction the Lord wanted them to go because the presence of God during the day was a cloud that would rest over the Holy of Holies. And if it would move, it would move east and it would, it would, it would move in the direction that the Lord wanted them to go and they would follow it. At night, it, they were that same presence was a fire that they could see that was over the Holy of Holies as well. For the cloud of Jehovah was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So they were covered. But remember, in the same way, you are the temple of God. And in the same way, the Lord wants to lead you by his spirit which is represented as a cloud by day and the fire by night. He wants to lead you. You are special to the Lord as a believer in Jesus. You're the temple of God. So we, it discusses the dedication here. And it says, Jehovah commanded Moses to assemble the Mishkan, the tabernacle, on the first month in the second year from the date of the Exodus, on the first day of the month, on Nisan 1, or the first new moon of the year, which is Rosh Kodashim. No, so this was done, and it's, it's very well spelled out here. Since Moses gave the commandment to begin the building the tabernacle on day on the day after Yom Kippur or on Tishri 11, it follows that it took less than six months for Bezalel and his team to create the tabernacle and all its finishing furnishings. And that's pretty awesome when you consider all 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 the things that they did to put the tabernacle together. Less than six months. The tabernacle, the Mishkan, was consecrated for seven days before God manifested his presence there. And during each of the seven days of consecration, beginning on Adar 23, Moses set up the entire Mishkan and offered sacrifices every morning and then pulled it down. On the eighth day, or Nisan 1, he put it up, but did not dismantle it again. Moses then appointed all its components with the sacred anointing oil called Shemen Ha Mishka. And this is when this is perfectly uh, looked at in the life of Jesus, in talking about the final week of Jesus' life. There's a lot to say there, but understand that we are talking about types, shadows, and patterns there. If you remember in the last week of Jesus, at the home of Simon the leper in Bethany, a woman with an alabaster box of expensive perfume anointed Yeshua. The word Mishka comes from the same root as Messiah, Mashiach, indicating that the anointing of the Mishkan would foreshadow God's plan of redemption given in the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. It, and, and 
in this Torah portion also, we see a, a number, the number seven is, is, is uh, repeated over and over. As we read through the scriptures, we find several groups of seven. It is easy to see similarities in the sequences in any two of these groups when lined up against each other. For example, there are similarities between the pattern of the building of the Mishkan and the pattern of God's creation of the universe. It's all there. It is a perfect replica of what God has in heaven and what he's given us in the earth to understand exactly who he is and where he uh, comes along in our lives. We have other uh, comparisons like the seven days of creation. We see the creation of the world as also represented in the construction of the Mishkan, the tabernacle. The first days, the first day of creation, had the heavens were spread as a curtain, it says. And of course, the curtains were over the Mishkan. On the second day, the upper lower waters were separated. In the Mishkan, the Parachet separates the holy place from the holy of holies. All of these things are, nothing is by accident. On the third day, the lower waters were gathered. And on the third day of creation, the gathering of the people, the bronze labor in the tabernacle. On the fourth day of creation was the creation of the sun and the moon and the stars. And of course, we see the light of the menorah lit in the tabernacle itself. On the fifth day of creation, we see the fish and the birds. And we have, have the, the in the Holy of Holies, the cherubim on the mercy seat. The sixth day, the creation of man, the dedication of, then we also see the dedication of Aaron as high priest. And on the seventh day, God rested and the Sabbath was set apart. And we see in the Mishkan, the Mishkan was anointed with oil on the seventh day. It says in Second Chronicles, now arise, O Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May your priest, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation. May your saints rejoice in your goodness. And of course, going back to Exodus 40, then the cloud covered the tabernacle and the glory of Jehovah filled the tabernacle. So all of this is going on, and which kind of completes our Torah portion for the day. But this is endless. This is this is timeless. And this is something that God has given to his people. And that as a believer in Jesus, he allows you to have it revealed to your spirit, the symbolism involved and the intricate nature that God has and the desire that he has. He is the one who designed us, and he is the one who wants to fill our tabernacle with him, the spirit of God. Now, at the end of every Torah portion, or at the end of every book of the Bible as we study, as and we're doing today, we have a, a ceremony that we do in our congregations, which is called Yasher Koach. During the concluding verse of each book of the Torah, it is customary for the congregation to stand as the final words are recited. Then in a dramatic manner, the Torah reader signals to the congregation, who then begin chanting, Kazak, Kazak, Benit, Kazak which means be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened. And this is something that we should be telling ourselves periodically. This is a cry of encouragement to continue with the reading of the next book and to return to this one again in due course. Torah study is an unending circle. It's, a, it's an ongoing revelation in which we hopefully discern more and more of God's revealed truth. And it's there as much as we can take it. He's ready to show it to us. May God help each one of us. The Hebrew exclamation, Yasher Koach, means may your strength be firm. And is often said to, con to congratulate people who've succeeded in their Torah study. So you get kind of a, a little pat on the back for finishing this book of the Torah. In Psalm 1611, it says, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And of course, we apply this to our study in the Torah because the Lord is showing us the path of life. We are discovering his presence, which is the fullness of joy in our lives. And at his, at the right hand of the one, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, he's at the right hand of the Father. And it says, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In Jesus, our future eternally is is secured, and we are so blessed to know this. For those of you who have studied Torah over the last year, uh, over the last Torah cycle year, to you is extended a heartfelt Yasher Koach. And the, the Yasher Koach is from actually the book of Joshua. It says, Have I not commanded you be strong and good and courageous? Do not be frightened, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. 
This is what the Lord told Joshua as he was getting ready to enter into the promised land. It says in Joshua 1, be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all that the law, to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. That's great advice for everyone today trying to walk with the Lord. We have the power of the Spirit. We have the Word of God. So we need to be strong and, and, and confident that the Lord is with us. It says in verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for Jehovah your God is with you wherever you go. And of course, Jesus is with us wherever we go, and he's with us now, and he gives us the confidence and the strength and the encouragement we need to move on. So we want to look at what it says here, and we want you to partake. Kazak, Kazak, Benit, Kazak. And we want you to walk in the strength of the Lord all the days of your life. But that strength comes because you're studying the Word of God and you're being led by the Spirit of God. Which brings us now to the Haftor section and in Pukude, which means countings. And we want to look at this too. It's taken from 1 Kings verses uh, chapter 7 and chapter 8. And it says, so was ended all the work that King said. This is talking about the, the, the temple that Solomon built. And this is, this is the backdrop of everything about the Haftorah. So was ended all the work that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord. And Solomon brought in the things which David, his father, had dedicated, even the silver and the gold and the vessels that he put among the treasures of the house of the Lord. Now, the, the temple that Solomon built was magnificent. It was, it was giant. It was very, very expensive. Remember, Solomon was the richest man that ever walked on the face of the earth. And we see that when they put the, the, the temple together, that they went into great times of, pre of preparation and building like nothing that you ever see anyplace else in the scriptures. And we see in the Torah portion, the half Torah, Solomon's, Solomon's testimony at completion of the work. And he had much to say. It says, Then the king turned around and blessed the whole assembly of Israel, while all the assembly of Israel was standing. And he said, Blessed be Jehovah, God of Israel, who spoke with his mouth to my father David, and with his hand has fulfilled it, saying, From the day I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I have never chosen a city among any of the tribes of Israel as the place where a temple should be built to honor my name. But I have chosen David to be king over my people Israel. So we see this, what is going, Solomon is going back to is the heart of his father David before the Lord. And this is to be understood in the context of which Solomon is bringing it. You can have all the niceties, you can have all the riches you want, but it comes back down to what is your heart like before the Lord? It says, now it was in the heart of my father David to build a temple for the name of Jehovah God of Israel. But Jehovah said to my father David, whereas it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. So we see that David's heart was on display before the Lord his God, and he couldn't build it because he had too much blood on his hands. But then Solomon completed the work. But you see, the whole point is that David's heart was right before the Lord, and he blessed the Lord. Despite any of the failings of David, his heart was right before God, and he wanted to serve the Lord. He wanted to do God's will, which brings us to the holiness of God, because Solomon goes on and he says, nevertheless, to David, you shall not build the temple, but your son who will come from your body, he shall build the temple for my name. So Jehovah has fulfilled his word, which he spoke, and I have filled the position of my father David and sit on the throne of Israel as Jehovah promised, and I have built a temple for the name of Jehovah, God of Israel. All of this goes back to what a blessing it was for Solomon to do it, but the real blessing goes back to David, whose heart was right before the Lord, who had pleased the Lord in all his ways. His heart was right. 
And, the, and Solomon said, and there I have made a place for the ark, and which is the covenant of Jehovah, which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. It all goes back to the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness, and it goes back to our hearts before the Lord as well. So this is all done before Jesus came. This is all done before Yeshua HaMashiach is there. And the, the symbolism that we see involved in the tabernacle and the temple is profound. And it all has to do with you as a believer in Jesus. Again, you are the temple of God. And it says again, as we as we look at in Hebrews 10, 3, but, but those, this is a reminder of our sins. And it says, because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, Jesus came to die for our sins. Through the sacrifices on the altar, they were washed, sanctified, and justified. Your temple, you are washed, sanctified, and justified before the Lord, your God, because of what Jesus did for us. You're the temple of the Holy Ghost, and this is reflected in the tabernacle, and it's also reflected in the temple. You're the temple of God. Now, right now, you are the temple of God. You need to present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You're saved because of what he did, not because of what you do. But if you appreciate that, you're going to walk in holiness and you're going to walk separated from the world because you understand and you appreciate what he has done for you. In Hebrews 10, starting in verse 19, it says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You see, let's look at the, the birth of Solomon in 2 Samuel, and we'll see this reflected. It says, then David comforted his wife Bathsheba. Remember, David had sinned miserably, and, and the, their baby that was born was born dead. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her, and she bore a son, and he called, and he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him and sent a message by Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Now, the Hebrew word Jedidiah means beloved of Yahweh. It comes back down to our hearts before the Lord. Jedidiah, that is what the baby, a lot of people miss this, but you have to understand that David's heart was on display before the Lord. And David, the beloved of the Lord, reconciled with God by naming him Jedidiah. In Psalm 44, we see this, a, a song of love given. It's a messianic psalm. It says, my heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the king. My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. The heart before the Lord is put down here in this psalm, and we see it wonderfully. It says in Psalm 45, 2, you are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. This is a psalm of David, but it's also a messianic psalm about what the Messiah means to his people. And that's why we're also told in the next verse, gird thy sword sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. This is how you approach God with a heart right before the Lord. You're the temple of God, but what is the state of your temple is what it comes down to. Is your heart right before the Lord? Is the love of God, is the, is the fruit of the Spirit within your vessel? You are the temple of God. In the next verse, it says, In your majesty ride forth victoriously in the cause of truth, humility, and justice. Let your right hand achieve awesome deeds. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. And you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. This, again, is a messianic psalm, and it's discussing the love between the Father and the Son. And we see this reflected in the life and the ministry of Jesus as well, as we discussed before. And it goes on, it says, All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia, 
out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. You can see the very great detail in the heart of the servant before the Lord and the great detail that the Lord has for his children. And he wants them to see that their hearts are booming before him with the love of God. And it says in Revelation 21, 9, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. This is the true fulfillment of the love that the Son has for his church, that we see reflected in the Father and Son, and we see it reflected in the Son talking to his bride. In Psalm 45, again, it says, Kings and daughters are, are among your honorable women. At your right hand stands the queen in gold from Ophir. Listen, O daughter, and consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also in your father's house. So the king will greatly desire your beauty, because he is your Lord. Worship him. And it goes on. It says, the king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is interwoven with gold. You see the same ornate detail that was in the tabernacle is also mentioned in this love affair between the, the bride and the groom, Jesus and the bride of Christ. It's all there that the Lord is beckoning us to come to him, and no detail is left unturned in his sight. And who is able to stand before the Lord, this, this holy God, it says in Samuel 6.20? Well, husbands love, your, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Jesus is the groom, we're the bride, and our husbandman, Jesus, gave his life for us that we might live. We are justified because of who he is in our lives. He's the one who came and shed his blood that we could be saved. He made us justified. That's who we are. Paul wrote that he might sanctify her, the church, having cleansed her by the washing of, of the water with the word of God. So we're cleansed by the blood of Jesus who saved us, and we're also cleansed by his word, which cleanses us as we go. Everything that we've been studying today is all part and parcel of the cleansing by the water of the word in our lives. Paul continued on, he said, and to present her to himself a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. You see, in Jesus, we are washed, we're sanctified, and we're justified. Praise the Lord, because he is our high priest, and he has shown us his temple. He's shown us who we are as his tabernacle as well, and here we go. So that ends our Torah portion today. What a, what a gloriously spiritual journey it's been studying the tabernacle and understanding that there's a lot more there than meets the eye. But we these things are spiritually discerned by people who are filled with the Spirit of God. And you can only be filled with the Spirit of God if you trust and believe in Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who came to die for us and to save us, and he is our soon coming king as well, and he's coming soon for his church, his tabernacles, all of us who trust and believe in him. God bless you. I hope you enjoyed this journey through the tabernacle with me today, and we'll see you next week. God bless. Shalom. Shalom.